Hi everyone, it's Martin and Matt again. Uh, last time we gave you some insights into the Chicago Tracon. Today we have a similar tour lineup for you of the DuPage Tower. DuPage is one of the smaller uh, but towered airports in a western suburb of Chicago. And we were invited to visit the tower there, uh, talk to some of the controllers, do a little job shadowing, and we'll sit down with uh, one or two of them and uh, get to ask some questions again. Come along. When's the busiest time of day usually? Uh, busiest time of day is usually between 10 and 6, depending on what day of the week. Okay. The amount of VFAR traffic we get, mm -hmm. students. Especially if it's nice and clear outside, well, they go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> are there, uh, what are the like, biggest corporations that regularly operate in and out of here? Uh, corporations. McDonald's. McDonald's. Oh, really? McDonald's right here. Huh. Uh, and I'm going to say NRG or Exelon Power Company. Okay. I wonder how many airplanes McDonald's has. They have two. A Global Express and a, I want to see a, a Golf Dream 5. Okay. We do get some Chicago-based celebrities that fly in and out of the airport. Good afternoon. Most important thing, a coffee maker. Yeah, lots of coffees drinking on the shifts. So welcome to DuPage Air Traffic Control Tower. Uh, DuPage is, from what I heard, the third busiest airport in Illinois. Uh, it's a GA reliever airport, and uh, right now we are currently staffed with uh, four controllers on board right now. On our far, uh, your far left is local control. Local uh, control uh, handles all the runways, landing and departing uh, from the movement areas of the runways. Ground control here, taxis, aircraft, in and out from the airport, non movement areas and the hangars out to the runway news. Then you have flight data clearance delivery, which handles uh, all the clearances, flight planning, weather information. And then we have a, a controller in charge sitting over in the corner. Um, if you pan around, DuPage Airport has four runways. We have the uh, main runway here, which is uh, two to zero right or two left. It's about 7,500 feet long, 150 feet wide, and can accommodate pretty much every aircraft flying except for the uh, heavies that are out there. That was our weather alert. And we have a parallel that can handle almost all the GA uh, stuff and business jets that we have out there. Uh, and those are uh, north-south runways. Over here we have an east-west runway that's mostly aligned like O'Hare. Most of your stuff's uh, east-west, but we have one there. That's an original runway. Then up at the very north we have 1533, which is kind of a short GA uh, runway. We average about 500 operations a day, uh, whether it be IFR or VFR uh, traffic. Uh, our st staffing complement of controllers uh, calls for 15 certified controllers plus a few what we call developmental controllers. And it usually takes about a year to a year and a half for somebody to check out here and uh, certify. Who would we have talked to this morning? Oh, that I was, I think that was you training. In the oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about everything we did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry if I did it. <laughs> so we have a, a row of uh, hangers up here on the north side that's called Echo Row. Illinois Aviation is one of our largest users of the airport. They fly a lot of uh, students fly out of there. Uh, and there are uh, six or seven Cessnas that they fly all the time. A lot of uh, corporate private planes and uh, kind of an FBO where you can do some quarter share stuff. Uh, if you took video of the front of the building when you came in, it's a very nice facility. They call it the Taj Mahal. <laughs> so, yeah, it is a really nice, but it's very, a very unique FBO building. Yeah. This big hangar down here, I think is the newest hangar. It's a transient hangar, so if you're flying and want to park overnight, uh, you can utilize their facilities and, and park in a very nice hangar. So this is what we call ETVS. It's our uh, primary communication system. We have frequencies listed here that we use for local control, ground control, flight data, and so on. 
and we can also talk to the trachon once you guys reduce it for the trachon so we can switch channels and just push a button to talk to the trachon mm -hmm. or the center if we need to. Uh, being in the tower weather is very important. We didn't know if we're IFR or VFR. So we have what we call our ASOS, is an automated sur surface observation system. And it will normally take an observation every hour or a, uh, a weather event like uh, low visibility, low ceilings will trigger a, uh, it to do a special observation. And that's the same data that we that, can that you listen can to get from the you, air. When you call, if you call the ASOS number or that we provide on the ATIS. That's interesting. So you actually do show station pressure here. So it's the we do. pressure yep. right at this actual elevation. Yep. Oh, cool. And then information next to it is, is what we call IDS-4. It's information that we share with the TRACON uh, about our runway and airport configuration. Right now you can see right there, we're advertising the RNAV two left approach and we're landing departing runways two left, runway 28 and 33. Uh, we have some equipment equipment outages on there, like runway two left localizers not monitored, and the hazardous weather and so on. And we have a current weather observation up there. When you record the ATIS, do you literally read the information from those screens? Yes, we, uh, we read it straight from there and record it under an ATIS that, that just repeats it every hour until we have to cut a new ATIS. So here we have to actually record the ATIS, which if you go to Midway or here, it's automated. Yeah. So it's a computer voice. And I appreciate that you do that here because the computer voice sounds like it's from before computers oh, were invented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stephen Hawking? Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> Stephen Hawking, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and then uh, this little monitor is actually our FDIO. Now, FDIO is Flight Data Input Output, uh, connection of flight plans to the NAS or to the National Aerospace System. Right here is a King Air. We can tell by the BE-20 is a King Air. Call sign 200 Delta Alpha. It's going from DuPage down to uh, Kilo Tango Delta Whiskey, and that's the routing. The routing is similar to the highways or interstates that you drive, you know, uh, cross country, yeah, yeah. except we just have different names for them in the air. And they're basically all made by waypoints. So the route for the Adele 5 all the way to Acme could have five different waypoints on it before it gets to Acme. And then from there, he goes direct to the airport. He's got the altitude he wants to fly out. And the P-1700 uh, is his proposed departure time. Okay, what's the top The top? Uh, that's his beacon code. Oh, okay. So oh, this, the this transponder, code, yeah, yeah. Transponder code. It. Okay. Yep. So this, if I'm on uh, Morgan's board over there, kind of how it works. If you guys call in, um, what's you guys call sign? Uh, seven zero Tango Bravo. Seven zero Tango Bravo. So you guys call us. So you call from the Southwest VFR. We'd look at look at the screen and we'd say, okay, um, we're gonna sequence you for two zero right. So then you'd be an inbound up there. And if you have um, guys active in your pattern already, you'll have. Uh, Um, you'd have these guys in the pattern for 2-0 right already and you just sequence him in as he comes in. If this guy's doing options, we note it there. And if he, he is on the go after the option, he goes back to the back of the line here. Uh, that's so cleared, not cleared. And this is how you sequence and we have, a lot of times we'll have two different uh, two different lines for runways. We'll have 2-0 right here, 2-0 left here. Potentially our crossing runway 10 or 2-8, you know, depending on. Um, yeah. What's going on? Same thing. Like if uh, let's say this guy calls up for taxi, yeah, ta I'm on ground control here. Uh, this guy calls up for taxi. He wants to four from uh, LMA Aviation. He wants to go southbound. So I'll uh, put him on local's board over here, <laughs> and that's where he'll clear guys for takeoff from this point. Okay. Uh, so it works out really slick, actually. One sec. It's simple. No, excuse me. Four proceed via Alpha. Um. Yeah, it works out. Works out really nice. I know a lot of towers like this will just use like a scratch pad, and they have to sit there and keep rewriting, um, you know, the call signs what they're doing every single time. Yeah, this works out really nice. You can just erase them really fast. You can move them around. You're it's pretty slick. And I'm guessing you get students that are doing like 15 touch and goes oh, yeah, in a row. Absolutely. And <laughs> yeah, we'll get. Uh, I mean, well, just last hour it's kind of slower. Now, last hour I think Clayton was uh, pure working local. I think he had four or five guys out in the pattern, so you know his his board was full of chips, sit, moving them around. It was uh, pretty good. There's times it gets real busy. We have uh, six, seven guys out there in the pattern. 
basically no, they, all we have here we, we run a slave system off of the Tracon, C90's Tracon. We do have our own data tag that we can use to tag a aircraft, but for the most part we run really tag it okay. up. Um, but what you've got here is the ring is the class Delta. There's our uh, runway configuration there. The dash lines are the extended funnels for the ILS 2 left. RF two zero right Years and the we, uh, IOS ten, the, and then the hash marks across to note the final approach fixes. These are the RF fixes the stars up there. Um, Aurora's airspace down here, and this data tag that you can see there, it's November four eight nine or three eight. Yeah, it's got some information underneath. Uh, it's destination airport, the altitude from the mode C from the transponder, uh, the aircraft type, time shares with the ground speed. Uh, with the last zero removed, so he's doing 90 knots. The HL is just an approach function just to let them know that the tag won't automatically drop when he lands. And then all these letters on the end there, the F, uh, you can see it a little bit on some of O'Hare's traffic there. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but I'm trying to pull one down here to the southeast. You can see a little better, so that's Envoy 4180. He's on a W tag, so the controller working that final is that tag, and then the other letters denote different final controllers. Okay. Same thing, altitude, ground speed. The echo denotes their uh, wake turbulence recategorization class, <laughs> and then they have an adaptation to give them miles and trail from the aircraft in front of them. So he's 3.6 miles and trail from the preceding arrival, which would be, that's AC4237. The the blob on the top right is that yep. precip? Yeah, that's precipitation. We have two different colors, blue and uh, like a mustardy yellow color, okay. and then more dots. Uh, there's six levels total, so blue with no dots is level one. That's light precipitation. It might, oh, not even okay. be old. might might just be Virgo. It might not be hitting the ground. That's moderate. Um, with the dots, if there were more dots closer together, that would be heavy, and then for the yellow color, it's heavy and then extreme, extreme. Is that composite or uh, yeah. base reflectivity? Yeah, uh, that's all composite. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so we're, we're not able to tell the altitude or, okay. or even the type, type of precipitation we can't tell. When, when we were flying out here, Martin and I were talking about how a lot of times we'll get uh, like precip advisors yeah, from ATC, and, we'll and we're looking out and we're like, yeah, there's, there's nothing. Yeah, it could be, you know, flight level whatever, or it could be at the surface. We really I see. Can't tell. We and we don't have it in range or uh, yeah. control over okay. that stuff, so it's just composite. Um, and then let's see, what are some other things? So the range rings that we can move those, these are five miles from DuPage, each ring. Um, and you can kind of sort of okay. dimly see O'Hare's Bravo there. And then there's a lot of uncontrolled airports and circles okay. with the dash lines. This is uh, Lewis down here. That's no okay. uh, With the ILS uh, 2. Clow, um, and these are both okay. private airports, uh, neighbor and, and landings condominium. This is uh, Joliet, Morris is farther down. Okay. And all of these squares with no uh, unique transponder codes, you know, Squawking 1200, those are just VFR targets. So he's at 3200, uh, doing 110 knots. And the blue is just, just speed trail, so you can get a rough idea of which way they're moving. But there's a lot of tools. Uh, we don't use it primarily just because we're a VFR tower. We only use it for basic radar identification functions and sequencing. But this, it, there's a ton of stuff. Yeah. Do, so. so this this is only a backup to your eyes. With what's most important, right. so what you see out the window. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and and especially controlling a tower pattern when you have that many uh, aircraft in there, it'll look a lot worse on here than, than it does outside. So. Do you see primary targets on this display also? Yeah, yeah we actually, uh, yesterday there was an aircraft um, that flew, transitioned through our space, the primary only without a transponder. And, um, can't quite see them underneath the fused symbols. I'm just looking to see if there were any primaries out there. But I don't see any. There would basically just be a little, the blue trail. There'd be a blue trail with like a green diamond over it, and that's all it would show. How do you control the lights? Uh, on the runway and taxiway. Right, uh, touch screen back here. Yeah, it's just right here, so you touch the screen. One sec. You can, you can turn on the uh, runways and um, individually, but we always have a preset page, so this is what we're on it now. So if it were to be, uh, um, were to turn them on now, all we have to hit it is night and select the visibility and then confirm. That's all we have to do, and it turns mm -hmm. the beacon on, beacon on and everything. 
You can shut runways off individually so you can just see two zero right lit up if that's what you want, but uh, pretty, pretty simple. Yep. How about the uh, status of uh, equipment like like the ILSs or other radio beams. Is that controlled here or is that done by the Tracon? Or? Um, we, we get the sensors here. We can actually see right over there on that board over there is a red light lit up. That's actually because right now our two left glide slope is out of uh, service. So there's a red light. Usually if everything's in working order, all those lights over there will be green. That's where we monitor okay. all of both systems. For, uh, runway 10, so we got lead and lights there. Mm -hmm. Here's one of the larger props that flies out of here regularly is a Cessna Caravan. Do you get a lot of cargo ops in here? Uh, rarely if we do. A lot of times they'll come in on like a DC-9 okay. or a Caravan. A lot of that's handled on the north field for cargo or even here at the flight center. Three two five, not a problem. The page ground runway three three taxi D uh, Alpha Bravo. Hold short of the runway two eight approach. So that's three two five, Roger that. Contact power one two zero point nine. Good pilots make for a, a fun day. No, uh, I don't know. I slow days honestly are can, can be boring. I think you know lately we've been pretty busy, so it's been fun most of the time. Just uh, good steady traffic, nothing too crazy, but steady traffic makes for a nice one. Right? Good weather, obviously. Um, yeah. Do you, do you like when you have uh, student pilots doing 15 touch -a goes in a row, or yeah, does it get kind of old? No, I mean, it doesn't really. I mean, it, it, it gives us something to do, it makes it fun. Um, yeah. As long as, the, as long as they're listening well, and you know, and if they, if, you know, everybody has to start somewhere, as long as it, when they're messing up and making mistakes, if the instructor steps in and uh, helps out, that helps us out when we're busy. So can, can you generally tell when a pilot is a student pilot, or do you prefer that they tell you that they're a student pilot? Either or. A lot of times we can tell, but a lot of times they will call up and tell us, too, and we do appreciate it as well. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we, we, we love student pilots, really, just... Uh, I mean, we're training up here probably as much as they're training down there, so we're pretty understanding that way. But, uh, you know, sometimes when you get super, super busy, we don't have time to repeat ourselves three or four times. That's the hard part, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, Alex, I think we can head down. Okay. So we got your guys in the interview. He's uh, going to be waiting in the conference room. Okay. okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. <laughs> Now I know where we are. All right, we are in the uh, DuPage Tower today. We got invited by the FAA to take a look, uh, take a look at the tower cap, and also sit down with a couple of controllers that work here. We're here with uh, Carlos and Bob. They both work here. Maybe we could start with a quick introduction. Well, uh, like you said, my name is uh, Carlos Stein. I've been at this tower for the past uh, seven months. I want to say six months. I, uh, I've been with the agency close to four years. I uh, transferred out from Miami Center, came out here. I'm Bob Loftus. Uh, I've been here for uh, nine months. I'm an operational supervisor. I've been uh, air traffic controller for 30 years now, and this is my eighth facility that I've worked at. I've done uh, both tower, en route, and uh, terminal. So I'm not a private pilot, though. Okay, yeah. So. Carlo, are, are, are you a pilot? I uh, took lessons. That's how I got into uh, into the whole uh, system and air traffic control and everything. I, uh, I got to a solo, and then at, at the time my wife lost her job, so I didn't have enough money to pay for those lessons, and I steered, I veered into uh, ATC. I asked the same question at the Tracon earlier, and I'm curious uh, what, what answer you have. Um, you know, when I think of, of pilots, you know, as kids, we look up in the sky, we see airplanes, and some of us, you know, the plant is seated, and we want to be pilots and, and fly. How did you guys know that you wanted to be air traffic controllers? What, what, um, was there a defining moment where uh, that, that became something that looked like fun? Did you get a tour of the facility and thought, oh, I could try that, or how did that work? All right, in my case, uh, well, my dad uh, was a pilot. He did not work as a pilot. He had a multi-engine certification. Uh, I grew up around, like, planes. My uncle, he uh, owns a corporate uh, uh, little, like, uh, aviation company. And then, so I grew up around planes my whole life. He took me out flying and everything. 
I wanted to be a pilot. That was my initial dream job. I took lessons and everything. But then, as soon as I got into that, my my own instructor was like, "Well, why don't you get into ATC? Uh, pay is great. You can work for the government. You already have the phraseology down and everything." I mean, and that's how like I was like, "Oh, let me give it a try." And I actually got into a CTI program down in Florida, and that really like made it for me. Like I was like, "Oh, this I, I really enjoy this. I really love this." Mm -hmm. that's, Ever since, that's how I got into it. Good. Uh, I wanted to be a fighter pilot or an Air Force pilot uh, when I was younger. Uh, my family's kind of either aviation or, or uh, farming background. So the moment I put on corrective lenses, I couldn't be a, a pilot for the, for the service. So uh, my uh, uncle flew F-4s, my neighbor uh, was an Air National Guard F-16 pilot, and my cousin was uh, Top Gun. He was in a, retired as commander of Top Gun. Wow. But so after, and I want to say in 86, when I put glasses on, I uh, talked with my mentor about uh, what to do in the Air Force. And he said, be a controller. You know, the strike happened in 81, and there's, you know, probably lots of openings. So I went and guaranteed, and I've been a controller since 1989. So and I still love it. Okay. What, what circumstances or what, what scenarios make a, make a good fun day for you here in the tower, and, and what makes a not so fun day? Uh, or is it always fun? Uh, in my case, I th I'm still training. I'm, I'm not fully certified here in the tower. Uh, from my center experience, uh, the weather really was the, when it got the most hectic at the root level. So you had to deal with a lot of deviations. You had to deal with a lot of uh, you know holding in positions that maybe you didn't want them to hold, or you had to do a lot of coordination with our controllers of the sectors and stuff like that. Uh, here in the tower, I would say maybe just like congestion of different aircraft coming in at the same time, having to know how to sequence them, different you know types of aircraft. You know, you have jets, you have props, multi props, turbo props. Knowing the you know where to sequence where. Um, uh, I think I, I would say like just complexity of it and how much of the pilots are really listening to the instructions that you're giving them and stuff, and uh, having to repeat yourself once, twice, or three times. Um, so, but but overall, I mean, I, it's really, I, I love what I do, I enjoy mm -hmm. the traffic. Good. Good. Uh, what makes it fun here? Uh, anytime you're, you get, I get a chance to be in the operation and actually talk to planes, you know, that just, I think it makes my day better. Uh, I was, I, you know, was a controller here just about a year ago, uh, and uh, you do it day in and day out, but when you go into management, uh, you deal with a lot of other stuff besides control planes. You deal with staffing levels, you deal with training that needs to be accomplished. Uh, you know, anything, equipment objects, and just that's a lot of backroom kind of paperwork kind of stuff that uh, I don't really enjoy, but I'm learning a lot, especially with UASs, if you guys fly drones or any of that kind of stuff. You know, that's a big thing going on right now, so I'm learning a lot about UASs and integration into the national airspace system with that stuff. But uh, yeah, any day you can get up in the tower and see that view or actually talk to pilots, that's just the best part of the day. Mm -hmm. You mentioned drones, which, which uh, has me kind of thinking, that's something that at least as a pilot myself, I'm, I'm a little <coughs> nervous about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm curious, what, how, how does drones, uh, what, is, what does drone operations mean for you? How does that impact your job? Uh, there's two types of drone operations. There's a the recreational uh, people that do it, you know, when you go out and fly your little Cessna you bought from a hobby store and, and go out and you build it for two months and then you know usually crash it. But then there's the part 107 guys who are uh, commercial drone operators now and uh, they're, they're making a living operating their drones so uh, there are regulations and guidelines now for people who want to fly drones. If you've ever heard of Lance, Lance is a system uh, website or a system developed by the FAA I want to say called Low Altitude uh, authorization network and basically it's it's a it's a gyro map uh, kind of like Google Earth but it has uh, all the controls uh, airspace on it and if you're within a certain distance of an airport it, it can tell you how high you can fly or if you can't fly mm -hmm. so if I brought my drone right now and set it right here on the sidewalk outside of the building uh, it would not let me take off because the drone I have is geofenced right so and they will ask you if you've got permission to fly really and you can override it, but hopefully these people who are f people who are flying these drones for that kind of they've already gone through the approval process. Uh, it's the, always going to be the bad apple who gets you know takes a video of a 
Boeing 737, like I'm sure you guys saw in Vegas, Vegas. he flew over the guy in Vegas and mm -hmm. flew out behind him. It's always somebody like, even though it's a really cool video, that's a dangerous operation. Right. So it's always the one person who's gonna who's gonna ruin it for everybody else. But uh, uh, my goal, being a model air, uh, airplane fighter myself, uh, is to integrate that into the system uh, as easily as possible and make it as safe as possible. One thing I'm curious about, and, and Matt probably has seen that more than I have met as a flight instructor, new students typically have a really hard time starting to talk on the radio. And I wonder if a, a controller who just starts training and has to use the radio for the first time, is there a similar... Oh, of course, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. There's, you stumble plenty of times, there's a, a sequence of ways, a, a sequence of events or way of saying things that you have to do it, and, and then you just you, you stumble upon it, just like a pilot does, like a single pilot does. Do I say the runway first? Do I say the taxi instruction first? Do I, uh, you know, like, it's, it's it definitely, it's true. Yeah, and you guys are probably held to, to much higher standards than pilots, right, and for, because you want everything standardized and, oh, and by the book. We have a book that we have to follow, and it's like the Bible in ATC 7110.65. Mm -hmm. They do definitely want to do it just like the book says. So right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so the FA has their 7110.65 that uh, we want to standardize phraseology across the whole national airspace system. So if you get a takeoff clearance here or you get, get it somewhere else, like on the West Coast, it shoots out the same. Uh, I know our biggest complaints with uh, new pilots is they're, they're either they're not uh, clear on what they want and they talk too fast. So a lot of it is just practice. And I, t and I tell new controllers, uh, talking faster doesn't, doesn't make things happen faster. So I want them to, to talk slower and more confident. I always say kind of with the southern draw. That, uh, and it seems like pilots uh, universally can understand that, uh, you know, that kind of a, a tone of voice. So if you're a student pilot, let us know that you're a student pilot, and we will take more time and assist you more than we would with somebody who we think is a professional pilot. Mm -hmm. In practice, you're driving down the street, and you're teaching a pilot, tell him to practice his calls. You know, if he drives, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm driving, I think of waypoints, or if I see cities, I think of things that are up in the sky that we use. But I also think about doing traffic calls, and I'm sure you've had a traffic call done for you, and I tell uh, controllers that are training to do the same thing with cars, like traffic, one o'clock, Quarter block, Mustang, opposite direction. You know, you can do the same thing as a pilot. Practice that stuff, you know, in your free time. Mm -hmm. Besides what you mentioned, are there, are there any uh, beginning mistakes or, or patterns of, of mistakes that you see a lot where you say, hey, if, if we could increase pilot training uh, or, or improve pilot training in, in a certain area or a couple of areas, that would make a, a big difference for us? Anything you can think of? So we have our top five. You know, everything we do is, is kind of safety related. You know. First of all, we want, we want everybody here to be safe, and then we want them to be professional, and then after that, you know, uh, efficient. And that's a, a, a evolution of, of progress and experience. So be safe first, do it professionally, and then try and be efficient. Yeah. You know, when Our mission, the FAA, is to uh, prevent a collision in the NAS and to expedite the flow of traffic. So those thing, two things, be safe, but at the same time, you gotta expedite flow of traffic. You yeah. Know? You know, like, keep everybody on the ground or delay it or anything like that and as a uh, I think as a tower terminal controller I think it's just as a student pilot I think it's just to keep everything standard more than anything and the pattern and stuff because we have different flight schools on the ground and they'll do maybe different types of pattern work so one of them a couple of them to just fly maybe one a mile and a half upwind mile maybe you know like on the crosswind Different type. If if everybody keeps it standard, like you know, as a controller, it's easier to manage the pattern. Otherwise, we just have to like micromanage or control the pattern with every single one of them. So yeah. I think that's one of the things that might help us, and that's what what we try to teach them or tell them that would really help us if everybody kept the like standard overall. So you were asking about pilots, right? And what we would like them to do, right? Uh, there's different phases of flight. If you're a pilot and you're a student pilot and you're uh, at an unfamiliar airport and you don't know the layout or you can't follow your map, map and you don't know where you're at, stop. Yeah. Stop. Great. Yeah. Ask, ask the ground controller, uh, uh, I'm here, what should I be doing? Because I'm confused with the instruction you gave me. 
We don't want a, a runway incursion to occur where you end up on a, uh, on a wrong, you know, you think this might be a taxiway and it's actually an active runway. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're, if you're not 100% not sure you should be there, you should just stop and ask for clarification. Okay. Uh, if you're in the air, listen. If you're trying to get a hold of tower approach control, even the center, and uh, just listen so, that, so you don't block somebody when they're calling. You know, because a lot of people just key up, and if you ever heard somebody else on the freak at the same time, you hear this, you know, static. So listen before you talk, and then also before you talk, know what you're going to say. Okay. You know, that will just you know make things so much easier for everybody. Definitely. It's probably not just true for aviation. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Something else I'm curious about, and that's from. Um, Having visited the, the tower in Cedar Rapids, where we're based uh, a few times there, typically the approach controller is also in the tower cap, mm -hmm. so everyone sees what is going on at all times. Here, it's different. It's called a tray cab. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so here the tray con is, is far away, mm -hmm. and that probably requires a more formal interaction with them. And I'm curious, you know, when, when you give somebody a takeoff clearance, uh, is there a departure corridor that's always yours, or do you have to ask for permission to launch somebody, or how, how does that go? What? So we're a VFR tower, and all of our rules are, are uh, via VFR. We can we do some IFR separation at the Tracon, which approach you like to, you talk about Cedar Rapids, but our Tracon is Chicago approach up in Elgin, and so they allow us to maintain visual separation on uh, some IFR between arrivals and departures. Or even uh, two IFR rivals, say one come from the north and south, if we say we have both in sight, then we can work them both. Whereas if, if it's not in sight, then the Tracon has to keep one until the first one lands, and then we can work the other one. Okay. So we can kind of expedite that uh, using our rules, because we have our rules that we need to apply, and they have their rules. Mm -hmm. uh, VFR uh, separation is uh, a lot uh, less, I want to say, restrictive. Because you were up at the trade gun and you saw they needed to do uh, three mile standard separation or a thousand feet. Whereas here, we just need to see blue between, you know, and we need to see that they're not going to hit. So it's, we can get a lot more done here uh, as far as uh, moving traffic in and out. Now, our VFR guys, when they depart, they know about Chicago, they know about Class Bravo. So they all tend to go to the west, north, or south. Very few of them go east. And if they do, you know, you can't fly in class Broadway aerospace without clearance. And a lot of pilots just don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So, and then yeah, uh, we, we will give them traffic advisories because our priorities are the runways out. We are separating stuff on the runway and then it moves out. And if you, you depart here via VFR, say you go to Aurora, uh, we will issue traffic if there's traffic in the way, but primarily we're separating aircraft on the runway. And then that's kind of an additional duty that you will issue traffic advisories further out away from the airport. Mm -hmm. So as a VFR pilot, you know, your responsibility is to see and be seen, and we can do the same thing here. If I understood you correctly, you can only, unless you see them visually, you can only handle one IFR operation at a time. Did I understand that right? Uh, yes. So uh, we could do, if we have an arrival at a certain moment we're departing, we could do an IFR departure, but we can't do two IFR arrivals at the same time. Oh, wow. Now, we can do two IFR departures as long as we had degrees divergence off after takeoff. So if they're diverging by more than 15 degrees, we can launch one. In a minute, we can turn, you know, launch another one behind them without the standard three miles of separation. But they'll have uh, degrees divergence separation until they achieve the three miles. Okay. So, so if you had multiple IFR <laughs> arrivals, would uh, approach then just try to sequence them? They will sequence them. They will slow them down. They will spin them. Okay. Yeah. So if it's a clear VFR day and we can get binoculars and see, okay, I got a guy from the west, guy from the north, and maybe, you know, whatever. If you can see all three and say, okay, we will coordinate with the Tracon, put him on a left down one, put him on a right down one, and send him straight in, then we can provide that separation for okay. them for the Tracon. At that point, it'd be visually, basically, mm -hmm. from the tower. I, I didn't honestly, I didn't even know there was a difference between a like a VFR tower and an yeah. IFR tower. Yeah, oh, yeah they made different just. Different set of rules, basically, because yeah. over here, like you said, is B and B seen. Basically, we see everything out of the tower. Uh, at a IF, an IFR approach, they actually provide IFR services, which we do not provide here at the tower. Mm. Just three miles, a thousand feet. Uh, we are not radar certified, although we have a feed from approach. We can see that just to orient us to see where the guys are in the pattern, but we do not use that as, as a radar per se. You know, services or, or resource separation. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah. how, how does a pilot know whether we deal with a VFR or IFR tower? Is, is the well, IFR they tower... Could, to they should consider every tower to be a VFR tower. Now, like Cedar Rapids is a tra is a tra uh, trade cab, so they can provide IFR services because they're up there, they're kind of like right next to each other. They know, I mean, they're sitting there talking to each other. Right. Whereas we need to do coordination, and the trade con up at Elgin is so busy that we can't be coordinating all the time with them. Sure. You know, whereas uh, every, uh, the, the uh, keel, keel around this all airspace is O'Hare. You know, what O'Hare does, the rest of us follow. If they're on East Flow, they're landing east. You know, we don't land. I advertise an uh, IFR approach to runway two zero because our, our final crosses their finals. Right. So they kind of steer everything that goes on. Uh, and uh, the stakeholders they have, you know, the, all the airlines and stuff. Uh, if anything goes on our hair, it's going to, you know, make the news. But here, we're just, you know, a smaller reliever re airport, and uh, we do what we can do. And sometimes if something's going on uh, that's, that's so busy at the Tracon, and you want to fly on here IFR, you might not get out, you know, depart as soon as you want to. You might sit on the ground for five to ten minutes mm -hmm. or longer, depending on, on traffic and depending on weather. We're a little spoiled with having our own Class Charlie Airport. That's oh, what we're used to. We're, so yeah, we yeah. have our own clearance delivery approach. And then when you go into Dubuque, you sort of just forget that not every airport has a radar. Those services, it, yeah. If, if you, for example, if you want to go into Dubuque and shoot approaches, they'll say, well, you need to go talk to Chicago Center. And we're like, oh, well, yeah. at Cedar Rapids, <laughs> they just hand you off. Yeah. And it's, it's we're, you know, they ha hold our hands. It's, it's So I know there's a great map out there somewhere on on airspace, but so there's, there's you know, there's three different kinds. There's tower, v, v4, there's tower airspace. And then there's approach control, right? You know, and then there's center. Uh -huh. You know, just you know, it's and I always describe it as like a five by eight hundred relay. You know, instead of a four by four hundred. So you you usually start off with the tower and airport, then you go to an approach control usually, then you go to center as your third one, back to approach control, back to tower. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would say five. You know, when you take everybody thinks, everybody who's flying thinks, oh, the guy in the tower is watching me and. It, that only lasts for a few minutes. And I think the best way to, for a pilot to find out is I think on the ADF, it will tell you exactly if you're going to an airport, or contact this for approaches, or the center approach. I mean, and it would have the frequency on it, so it's just, I guess, that thing is an easy way to just know exactly who to contact if you're going to a certain facility. Mm -hmm. or, you know. Uh, maybe a tactical question. Um, at Like at Cedar Rapids, for example, it's quite common that we get cleared for the option. Um, but sometimes it seems like if you're clear for the option and you do a, a, sh a full stop, they seem surprised. Uh, so it's kind of an internal debate, at least with, with a lot of my students and people in Cedar Rapids. Would, would you prefer that we still tell you that we're full stop, or do you really not care? Coming from a student by myself, which I was, I think I remember the time when they claimed for the option. I, was, uh, I understood it as, oh, either like a low approach uh, missed approach or uh, just a touch and go basically not a full stop so that's a great question I think uh, right now I know for a fact that there are five things that uh, com compose of uh, the option uh, clearance so uh, there are times where like yeah I remember like giving clearing somebody for the option and they're like oh this is gonna be a full stop and even I be like all right so clear land but even my trainer be like oh he's clear for the option you don't have to say anything. I mean, like, because that, that includes the option, full stop. Mm -hmm. So, but I think clarification would be great. It would, you know, I think it would always be great. If it's, oh, I just want to <laughs> clarify if it's going to be a full stop. Because that actually helps the controller know that, oh, so he's going to end the, the approach into a full stop. I have somebody sequenced behind. I know exactly what he's going to do. Maybe, you know, like, slow the guy down on the approach or something like that. So it gives him a heads up of what you want to do. Yeah. That, that helps a lot. I, as a pilot, I try to balance between I don't want to surprise my controller. I love to always make sure that he or she knows mm -hmm. what I'm going to do, but I'm also super sensitive to not just wasting a bunch of time on the radio, so we're always trying to find that perfect balance. And there are a lot of things, one of the things that they, they teach us upstairs is just like to keep it actually clearer than the option. Like if, if you want to do touch and goes, I, I, think, I think that's even better than telling us, oh, I want the option, because I know exactly what you're going to do, what you're going to be doing, and what to plan for that. You know? I do too. I think uh, just awareness is, is very good. An option could be a lot of things. And if you do do a full stop or a stop and go, we're going to spend a lot of time on the runway. Uh, the spacing we have behind with the next aircraft might, might not be sufficient. 
So I don't know how you instruct your your students, but uh, if you tell them to report midfield, uh, midfield right down one, like system one, two, three, a beam in the tower, or however you do it, uh, that's when a good time to say uh, for the touch or for a touch and go or for uh, uh, low approach or whatever. Yeah. Be clear, but in that way, there's no surprises. You know, and a lot of times I know some. It depends on how how congested the frequency is. Mm -hmm. But if you're taxing out for some pattern work, be very clear on what you want to do with the ground control. Like say, hey, I want to do five touch and goes, then we want to do four uh, full stop taxi backs. And then that way we'll ride on our, ch our trip up board and we'll pretty much. We even tell our student yeah. pilots to just let, to let us know exactly which type of pattern work they want to do because all the time they're like, oh, it's just we want to taxi out for pattern work. But it help us, helps us out just to let us know exactly which type of pattern work. Mm -hmm. Or what we're going to do touch and go, stop and goes, low approach, I mean, whatever you want to do. So. So you like to hear their entire plan as early as oh, yeah. possible so you can plan If they're going to stay in the pattern and not depart, definitely for sure. Okay. I mean, you're always safe on the ground, and there's always time when you're on the ground. Right. When, you, when you're in the air, there's not time for yeah. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Because even I, I remember, like, guys, uh, I would clear them for a uh, full stop, man, and then, oh, can we make this a touch and go right on the ground? Yeah. I don't have anybody behind you. <laughs> go for it. You know, but what if somebody else was behind them or there's something else going on? So it'd be easier just to, I mean, to know exactly what you guys are planning to, to do. It's kind of like the blink, blinker on the car. You hope the person in front of you uses it, but not, you know, they don't all the time. But at least if you're aware, there's no surprises. One other topic, the topic of training. In the Tracon, we saw kind of a back room where there were uh, controllers in training on scopes that looked just like the real ones. And then there was another room where there were pilots simulating the, the other side mm -hmm. of this. Is there anything like that for training of tower controllers uh, that you can think of? Uh, we, we do. I mean, at O'Hare, actually, the tower, we have some flight simulators. I mean, the simulator, actually, for the tower. Uh, so we have big screens, and we have remote uh, pilots actually operate on the back. And mm -hmm. we, I've actually gone there and trained myself mm -hmm. on like different... That's things. in the O'Hare tower? Yes. Oh, OK. Oh. It's called the TSS Tower uh, something Simulator. Tower Simulator. Tower system. Tower Tower simulator simulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, if you uh, searched uh, YouTube, I'm sure you would see some of those videos from, say, like Mike Baroni Center down where the FA Academy is, because they do use those a lot down there. But usually larger facilities, districts like uh, here, uh, O'Hare has one. I'm sure, uh, I know I was working on the West Coast for a long time, and uh, for the Bay Area airports, they have one at uh, the old uh, Bay Approach facility that's right there at the Oakland Airport. So all the little uh, airports in the Bay Area, like San Francisco, San Jose, Hayward, Concord, Livermore, Reed, Hillview, can all go there when they first start training to kind of get uh, uh, accustomed to the airport they're going to work at. Right. Anything else that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share with the world, or any questions that you have for for pilots, or anything that we might be able to answer for you? I don't know, the, uh, as far as a pilot. Uh, don't be, uh, don't be afraid to, of ATC. We might come off as the big bad person on the owner of that radio. And I know there's probably a lot that sound pretty grumpy, but uh, we're all pretty good people and we're here to help. So uh, just be clear on the radios, ask or tell us what you need or what you're looking for and we will try you know, to comment your request. Yeah, definitely. I, I just have to say I love this job. I absolutely <laughs> love it. I can't believe that I do this for a living. So I uh, encourage any pilots that would like to look into going into ATC to be honestly. That's good. Oh, and then also NACA. So our controllers are, are part of the National Air Traffic Controllers Association Union. And uh, they do a great job of collaborating with the FA and FA management when, in regards to uh, safety and uh, just all the uh, stuff we do as an entire workforce. So mm -hmm. I want to give them a plug. Yeah. As far as uh, safety of flight, uh, weather is one of our top, you know, our top five, and we don't want to put you into weather uh, that's going to impact your flight. And so, when you guys are flying, and if you do have high reps, uh, whether it be good or bad, we want to know. We want to know if it's smooth air. We want to know if it's turbulent. Uh, you it's name it. Because if you tell us, if you guys tell us, then we will tell everybody else, hmm. or we'll put it out there. Uh, you know, it'll be on the any pie reps for turbulence or that stuff will show up on Sky Vector or on A cars or your uh, glass cockpits. You know, th those things come up. Yeah. So, more information about weather and flight conditions is is better. There's absolutely nothing more accurate than a pie rep. 
if you think about it, honestly. You're there, you're experiencing it, and you're passing it along to your fellow colleagues, basically. So. And, and you want those pie reps just at all times, or is it just when conditions are different than what yeah. you expected? Yeah, or? like if, if you if you did your pre-weather uh, briefing and you're going for a flight that says uh, possible convective activity or turbulence in the area, and you prepare for turbulence and there's no turbulence, you can tell ATC, hey, there, there's no turbulence here. Mm -hmm. But if there if there is and it wasn't forecasted and you're encountering, you know, icing or anything, you know, let us know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let us know. Anything else you want to ask, man? No, I think you're good. Right. I'm hungry. Yeah. Carlos, <laughs> well, nice, nice talking with you. Thank you. Nice Bob, Martin. Nice talking with you. Matt, thank you nice for being here. Nice thank you for being here. And thank you for keeping us safe yeah, on the field. Definitely. That we, I, like I said, I love my job, so I, uh, I love what I do and I'm giving you I mean, the best service I can. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's uh, Martin with an. <laughs> yeah, the, the confusion, you know, or the people with the flashlights. <laughs> I've done yeah. that, I did that once, but yeah, those aren't air controllers, yeah. they're aircraft <laughs> marshallers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs>